I'm Kitty Bloomfield, co-founder of New Strength and Saturate, creator of pro-metabolic food supplements and seriously saturated skincare. And today I have our friend Keith Littlewood, or you know he's known as Tomo uh, on Instagram, back on the podcast. We've done heaps of podcasts uh, with with Tomo, so go back and listen to those ones. Welcome back. Good to see you, Kitty. <laughs> we always have a How good the fuck team. are you? I'm <laughs> fucking great. Thanks very much. He likes to swear as well. I love swearing. My wife doesn't like me swearing, but I just say I don't really trust anyone who's not prepared to swear. (laughs) Yeah, so if you don't like swearing, maybe don't listen to this podcast. Um, So, Keith, he's got his master's in endocrinology, and you're currently doing your PhD, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, uh, The struggle is is real. (laughs) Uh, How's it going? Um, You've got three kids? Three kids, hey. Three kids. One yeah. that doesn't talk to me at the moment. She's at university, <laughs> um, so that's that's slightly easy to manage. The other two are kind of just fighting all the time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's like the struggle is real because I'm trying to do it part time, which is over six years. Oh so God. I do two to three days a week, and the rest is my my working week. So it's just a struggle trying to juggle everything around. You know, um, it's uh, it's a challenge. All my other PhD colleagues are half my age and full time doing it full time. So it's like, yeah, I wish I was doing it full time because it's like every Monday you go into the lab and it's like you feel like you've just come off summer holiday. It's like what um, am I doing? That's so funny. Yeah, I know. I don't know yeah. how you do it, eh? With kids, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be long six years. Yeah, well, then, it's nearly the first year's nearly gone, so ah, it's gone quite quickly. Well, there you go, one sixth of it down. And then, can we call you Doctor Tomo Littlewood yeah, after that? If I can defend my thesis and the research yeah. looks good, well, that's a long way off yet. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. We, we'll be calling you Doctor Tomo in no time. Ah, uh, so today I think, I think I, Tom, Tomo will be fine. <laughs> I wanted to get Doctor Tomo back on the podcast just to talk about um, some co- common blood tests that. Uh, may, I don't know what the, how you want to articulate this, but maybe misinterpreted or, you know, like people will get them and then they freak out and, you know, potentially they don't mean what they mean. So I just thought we'd go over some of the main ones. Um, and let's start with, let's start with cholesterol because I feel like that is a real, that's a, that's a big one. Like a lot of women get their, you know, the, the cholesterol back and the doctors will be like, oh, it's like 5.5. It's so high. You know, you yeah, need to go on statins yeah. or so can you talk about like cholesterol, you know, what it does, like are those ranges necessarily like correct? I don't know if that's the right word, but you know, like I think, you know, they, they like some, they, some of them say like, oh, we want people to be at four, like such low cholesterol, which is not necessarily good either. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cholesterol is obviously the base for steroidal hormones. So if you, if you don't have an optimal amount of cholesterol and cholesterol conversion, uh, then there's the steroidal hormone pathway. You don't get adequate production of pregnenolone, progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen. Uh, and so the, the idea, and then another key component of cholesterol is it's an anti-inflammatory. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an antioxidant that's often elevated when your body is inflamed. So seeing cholesterol elevate is, 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 a, is a warning to sign to say, oh, actually, maybe something's not where it should be. The other key component and a well-known uh, symptom uh, an expression of low thyroid function is high cholesterol. So these days, the the levels have been gradually brought down and down and down uh, to fit this reference range, which is ideal really for creating more uh, clients, patients, customers for for statin medication. Now, the idea that the lower the better is not borne out in primary care. I think there's some justification or cardi- cardi- cardiologists will say there's some justification for people who are in Im- imminent um, susceptibility of having a heart attack may benefit. But for primary care and trying to avoid heart disease, trying to keep cholesterol as low as possible is quite problematic because if we don't have enough progesterone and particularly testosterone available, we know that has an impact on the heart. Now, at the moment, you're absolutely right. As soon as it gets to about 5.5, there's this big red there next to it. It goes high. And anybody, people start to see warning signs and red flags and go, oh, my God, I'm out of range. And this is kind of, I think this is part of the, the strategy to get people to say, OK, what can we do? I think any good doctor these days realizes that lifestyle interventions trump many, many, many medical interventions. So getting your cholesterol, I think that the, the appropriate range, and this isn't my opinion, this, is, this isn't just my opinion, this is born out of a very large study which came out of Korea, I think, in ni- 2019, looking at 12 million people, uh, South Korea. And um, it said that the people with lower cholesterols tended to have more incidence of uh, uh, 
death basically so they they said that perhaps for total cholesterol the the, the the good range would be around about 210 to 250 which is about two uh sorry which is about 5.5 to 6.4 uh minimal per deciliter so actually going as low as possible is actually going to impede your ability to protect your body from having this antioxidant like effect it's all going to decrease the steroidal hormones and it also interferes with you know uh there's, there's a particular pathway called HMG co-reductase, which is where statins interfere with, which will also have an effect on magnesium levels. So we get this kind of dual effect of kind of inhibiting protection around the heart. So the lower, the better, I don't think is, isn't borne out from any solid, robust um, biology. And what you've got to look at is some of the end range stuff. And there's also some suggestion these days that statins also have an effect on mitochondria and probably may interfere with their ability to produce energy. So I think when you're looking at the cholesterol test as an example, don't be kind of uh, scared by that red H. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, and as I said, getting it about 5.5 is probably a really good starting point. Mm. There's a really interesting approach here as well, is that people with familial hypercholesterolemia where they have quite high cholesterol levels you know around about eight nine sometimes even higher um so there was I, I read a really interesting paper that those people with high cholesterol levels that hadn't been interfered with for over prescribed uh, uh any drugs or kind of treatment for that generally lived as long as their kind of family members that didn't have that and other people but they found that when they started interfering by trying to prescribe drugs and 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 to lower the cholesterol that's when familial hypercholesterolemia patients started dying a lot a lot younger age so I, i'm sure there are some cases where it goes really really high that might need something but it, it, for, as a general perspective keeping your cholesterol in that 5.5 to six and a half is, is really good and even if you're going over slightly unless there's kind of any kind of key pathology, I don't think it's something really to be concerned about. Now, obviously I'm not a doctor, I can't go against the diagnosis that a doctor gives you, but I encourage anyone just to look at what cholesterol is, does, what are the ranges that would be protective for it? And don't necessarily think that you have to keep lowering and lowering and lowering it. Um, but I think, you know, that total cholesterol of, of around about 5.5 to 6.5 is useful. The LDL around about 150. Some people suggest that the HDL is the, the good cholesterol. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as good and bad cholesterol. They both have different roles to play. Uh, but certainly there are smaller particles of lipids that can cause problems uh, in the VLDLs and some of the kind of fluffier stuff that's associated with it. So I think also looking at uh, cholesterol as being protective and, and having this antioxidant effect mm. and also being a, a key indicator of thyroid function. Most people with uh, low thyroid, their cholesterol will elevate. Now, there are loads of key symptoms, as we know, we've talked about many times, what are the key symptoms uh, and kind of di things that will add to a diagnosis of low thyroid function. Uh, and I think cholesterol it might not always be as elevated as, as one might think in low thyroid. Everything doesn't tick the boxes. You don't have lateral third of the eyebrow loss, constipation, low energy, brain fog, uh, infertility, uh, high cholesterol. Not all of these things just tick at the box all straight at once. Mm. There are different components of physiology that will say, okay, this, this bit's not functioning as well as it could be right now. This bit's not functioning as well as it could be. And, and over time, they may all get to that point. But they very rarely tick all those boxes all at once. And that's where you can look at other aspects of blood testing. I'm really, really interested in looking at symptoms because at the end of the day, people will go to a doctor or a, a, a nutritionist or a functional med practitioner or whatever it is, a coach, uh, and they will have specific loss of function. And I think that's what you have to address is what is it that is in someone's life right now that they don't have that's making them miserable. And you have to work on relieving symptoms and getting their function back so that those symptoms mm. don't keep being expressed. It's all very well going to a test uh, uh, for a, a, a checkup. And this is where kind of people like the, even Illich, who I'm a big fan of, would always say that going to a checkup is a great way of turning a person into a patient, literally mm. one foul swoop, right? Because you get someone who's out of these arbitrary markers that say, right, you have a disease now. And it's going, but I, I feel fine. But no, but your, your blood tests say that you're way out. Yeah. Uh, and sure, there could be somebody who's actually really, really sick and a very small, minute possibility that somebody could be really sick. But as a rule of thumb, this is where overdiagnosis and overtreatment tends to create more problems. So this is why I think not looking at blood tests as this kind of holy grail. Look mm -hmm. at some of the symptoms that are being expressed. And we know and we've talked about thyroid and we'll probably lead into that in a second about why stress, high adrenaline, 
high cortisol can suppress thyroid function and then everyone goes well the doctor will go well your blood tests appear completely normal and are those ranges actually accurate at, at detecting proper hypothyroidism in its mm. subclinical forms and do they affect everyone at, at any given time mm. okay cool all right so next one a common one um is T- tsh and why is it maybe not a great marker of thyroid function and then what tests would you get so i think tsh you know i think the 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 use of that typically came about in the 70s uh and it kind of started to be used to trump the doctor's uh clinical thought process where they were using things like the metabolic rate test basal metabolic rate test Mm. cholesterol achilles heel reflex test uh to detect hypothyroidism now the thing is the tsh tsh is the pituitary hormone thyroid stimulating hormone that's generally sensitized from from the pituitary and other mechanisms from feedback loops in the blood to help the thyroid gland to start secreting more thyroid hormone in, in t4 and t3 and usually in a four to one ratio so t4 is considered the the precursor to t3 that's more metabolically active Mm. now tsh for example and there are kind of more emerging problems with tsh from from a research perspective is that that they that set point of tsh production if a mother is is so as exposed to a certain amount of pollutants the tsh set point in utero while while she's pregnant and we're talking across organisms here be it kind of rats or humans the research is not so clear because we can't Mm. do that research Uh, it's unethical Uh, but in rodents there's there's some emerging research that suggests that there are disturbances that alter the feedback mechanism during pregnancy Mm. so when you come to do a tsh test then you might not see the thyroid test being disturbed you might see kind of diabetic like states you might see high cholesterol and other disturbances but the other component particularly more relevant for humans is that high stress, high adrenaline will suppress TSH production. Mm. High estrogen can have an effect of kind of disturbing the amount of thyroid that's being produced, but usually sometimes with long long range of estrogen exposure, you might see TSH being increased. But imagine you're going to the doctors, uh, typical mum running around stressed, not eating enough, uh, and that she's got all these symptoms. She's constipated, perhaps her hair, hair's falling out. She's got some menstrual disturbances and she might be very well over, overweight or underweight. It's difficult to say because that doesn't really represent a hypothyroid person. You could be normal weight, you could be overweight, you could be underweight, but you go and have this thyroid blood test completed and the TSH looks absolutely normal. Um, and so they go, well, your thyroid's not, you know, it looks fine. Oh, but your blood pressure's looking slightly high. Your, your cholesterol's looking high. Let's try and get you on a statin or an antihypertensive and any good doctor should go lifestyle interventions to start with. Um, but that's the, 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 the component of thyroid that I think that's that's muddied a lot of the waters. And, and you know, why so many people tend to fail from going for a, appointments because they they could have a thyroid issue. And the emerging stress and pollutants that are in the environment can also impact that and make that look as normal as it would be. So that's where I think it's useful to look at the other tests like t3 and t4 you can look at you can glean some information from the total and the free versions of thyroid mm. hormone mm. Uh, classic case uh, two two cases recently just in the last 24 hours uh, a client with her daughter uh, online saying and she, i think she has adhd and her tsh is two now most people the reference range for tsh is between 0.2 and 4.5 and doctors won't even consider your that you're low thyroid until your tsh goes above 4.5 or 5 yeah. in some cases uh now she was at two and, and i'm a firm believer that um your tsh should be as low as possible because it's it's a it's a, a backup response that the pituitary produces more tsh to cope with failing levels of t4 and t3 so the tsh ramps up this production so hers was over two but her her free t3 and free t4 were actually in the lower 25 percentile of the reference range mm. which suggesting she's lower end and she's got plenty of symptoms and there is, is some research on ADHD and, and thyroid function. So, you know, with, with that kind of in mind is that her TSH is on the higher side of things from, from my perspective. And her th- thyroid hormones are on the lower end from from a reference range perspective. So how many years do you have to wait for that to catch up? So you can actually diagnose someone with low thyroid function. And that's why, you know, really good doctors, one in Canada called Dr. David Derry, one in the UK, Dr. Barry Durham Peafield, were struck off for treating symptoms of thyroid disease 
because they ignored the thyroid blood test. That doesn't that doesn't speak to me of, of people who are being unprofessional. That speaks to me of somebody who's critical and able to use their mind and able to look at someone and use historically older thyroid tests that were poo-pooed by modern medicines to make a decision. And they improved so many people's lives, but ultimately they paid the price of being struck off the medical register but mm. for treating people in that way. Mm. And so this is where you can look at, you know, many, many other tenets of blood tests to, to look at thyroid function. You can look at, you know, red blood cell markers like hematocrit and hemoglobin. Uh, and, you know, this is where some people would say, oh, would classically treat people with anemia. But if you have low thyroid function, perhaps these thyroid blood tests might be complete, completely normal. But your kind of anemia type blood tests of low hemoglobin, which is obviously that the red blood cell protein uh, and hematocrit, which is another part of the, the, the red blood cell. If they're on the lower side of things, if you have low, low thyroid function, it means your bone marrow is, is suppressed on how many blood, blood cells it's producing. So mm. those red blood cell indices markers could be lower. But typically, then someone would look at maybe iron and ferritin and say, oh, the iron's low as well. But if the iron could be low, and iron on its own is a complete waste of time as a blood test to, to diagnose someone with anemia. But if these kind of other blood cell markers that are on the lower side of things, then you can use that as a suggestion that the thyroid is on the lower side of things as well. Mm -hmm. And that's why I still believe using something as crude as the the basal temperature test using a thermometer and pulse rate is an absolutely great way of of looking at it it's not it's not perfect mm. it's certainly not perfect and sometimes you can get a better indication by using the mouth and comparing it to the armpit using the pulse rate as, as well as i said with that um and using the sub subjective things that you kind of experience from a day-to-day -day basis which might be fatigue um it might be cold hands cold feet constipation insomnia or, or kind of even excess sleeping um and you, you've got to kind of play it by ear really but i think looking at the tsh on his own is a complete waste of time mm. and that's why i think so many people are failed by the medical system because doctors would just look at tsh because they've been taught to think in this algorithmic way and tick boxes which makes their life easier and quicker but it kind of a lot of people go through the net mm. No, makes sense. All right, next one. Um, estrogen and progesterone. So uh, estrogen and progesterone, I think, and I, I'm not the first person to say this, it was the, the great late Ray Pete who said that measuring uh, estrogen in the blood is a, is a really bad way of, of getting an idea of the levels, primarily because just the blood is not where everything is always stored as well, right? So you in, in tissue, and uh, in adipose tissue, you can get stores of estrogen. Um, in the cells, there can be plenty of estrogen. You can perhaps look at some of the, the markers that you might get from urine tests and, uh, you know, something like a Dutch test, for example, where you can also see the oxidized metabolites of estrogen. Um, estrogen, when it can actually enter the redox cycle and cause an excess amount of, you know, damage, you know, if people people's mitochondria and their cells don't function well. They produce a lot of lipid peroxides, which is essentially fats being you know, overused and damaging the cell because you lose things like glutathione. Now, estrogen will kind of, you know, increase the amount of glutathione that's being used and, and reduce glutathione. So it can have a, have a real impact on your oxidative stress pathways. Mm. And this is where, you know, understanding how things like vitamin C and vitamin E can, uh, can be really, really useful. But the, the, essentially the, the test itself, doesn't actually always represent anything meaningful because there are so many other components to where estrogen is being stored. It's a bit like, you know, iron values to a degree is that when you're sick, you'll kind of partition iron values off. Um, and sometimes the cells do this to prevent iron going into the cell and overloading it. So it's always as well, people will often go for blood tests when they're feeling sick or unwell. Um, and that's not always a good place to get blood tests done, because mm. in some cases, the, the actual expression of, of the test that you need to see are totally masked by the other things. That's not the case all the time. But sometimes it's like if I'm working with coaching clients, I get a lot of people saying, what blood test do I have done? I go, none. Let's let's get you on an even keel to start with. Let's get your nutrition sorted. Um, if you if you're kind of doing that all right already, feel free to go and get some tests done. But often most people don't need to. And, and you and I both know from working with many people is that if you get someone on an even keel with nutrition, manage their stress, get their exercise right, 
get their sleep right and females getting their menstrual cycle kind of perfect or or as close to perfect function as possible getting guys with optimal t values you know these are the these are the things that will kind of normalize blood tests and by the time you've actually got that done Mm. they're feeling well enough where they don't need to go and get any blood tests done Mm. that's that that's not to say that that's everybody because you know the best will in the world you know (laughs) we still see plenty of people that eat really well but still have problems and this is where the testing can can come into play and usually a good time to get some of the tests done if they've been doing all the right things um and uh you know sometimes you know there's some environmental stuff that needs to be tweaked within their own environment that that can improve that so yeah it's uh I, i think blood tests have a place but they're not the, they're not the kind of gold standard that that the mm. physicians kind of always rely on. Mm, mm. No, that that makes sense. Um, and uh, what about iron and ferritin? Yeah. So as we kind of touched on briefly there, that, you know, people are uh, particularly females are often told they're anemic, uh, and the, the the values that are often looked at are iron, ferritin, uh, tissue iron binding capacity, transfer and saturation. These are all useful tests. Now, the, the, as I said, the, the, the iron test by its own doesn't mean anything at all. But low iron with low ferritin can give an indicator of heading towards anemia. But sometimes with low thyroid, you can still see this marker. This is why looking again, looking at the hemoglobin and hematocrit values. And also we have other red, red blood cell markers as well, uh, such as uh, mean corpuscular hemoglobin content or MCHC or MCV. Um, mean corpuscular volume, and also another one called RDW, which is red cell distribution width. Some of these will have varying issues, but you can usually tease out with with thyroid um, whether these are actually someone is actually anemic or not. But I think in a lot of cases, people can be anemic, um, but actually the, the pre- presentation is being anemic. But also the thyroid is actually what's low here. So I think it's really important to kind of tease that out temperature and pulse again here if the rgw is elevated sometimes even above 13 uh, mm. that can be an indicator of low thyroid function it can be of of anemia as well but i think you know looking at could the cholesterol be involved here could uh liver enzymes be altered um could uh could uh, other aspects of inflammation oxidative stress be elevated in, in certain blood tests could we see disturbances to kind of you know blood cell magnesium and, and other tests so i think iron in itself and anemia it's i think that's relatively easy to resolve because you know people often put on iron tablets which cause constipation and other issues and, and insomnia and i think you know getting someone to eat red meat with a glass of orange juice is probably the best way to resolve uh, anemia rather than going on on uh, a high dose of iron supplements but uh, at the end of the day I think most most anemic clients that I've seen have never been anemic they've had low thyroid function mm-hmm. okay cool and, and also also the myth that heavy heavy menstruation also is is a key of anemia sometimes many many females do not um have um uh that significant a blood loss mm. Mm, okay, cool. And the last one, uh, calcium. Calcium. So, you know, calcium is something that you, uh, can be dysregulated for, for many reasons, but usually sometimes when you kind of have a high, relatively high phosphorus to, to calcium diet, uh, sometimes you'll see, and this is where sometimes testing parathyroid hormone would be useful. Um, if calcium is on the lower side uh, in your body, you'll tend to see hypercalcemia. Because what happens is the parathyroid hormone will increase the amount of uh, uh, calcium that's leached or resorbed from bones and goes into the bloodstream and can be relatively un- unregulated. So, again, looking at kind of you could look at phosphorus ratios, calcium ratios, you could look at kidney function that can give you a good indication. And again, remember, just like any other organ function, kidney function is intimately related to thyroid function as well. Mm-hmm. So understanding uh, the dysregulation that's associated with thyroid uh, dysfunction as well. But yeah, if you're seeing kind of hypercalcemia, it's usually because, or these hypercalcemic states, it's usually because the, sometimes calcium regulation is poor, calcium mm-hmm. intake is poor. Uh, sometimes this is where getting consuming adequate dairy products is very, very useful. Uh, very well cooked greens can be useful in, in calcium as well. And also getting adequate K2. Now, I, I like to eat a lot of cheese. 
So I, I, I touch my K2 values from cheese, but I also find that a K2 supplement can be quite useful as well sometimes. So, you know, I think resolving uh, the calcium tests and again, understanding why, why the calcium values can be elevated or, or decreased in the first place. Yeah. Awesome. Is there anything else like main ones that you want to touch on? Uh, no, I, I, I think they're the main ones. I mean, li- liver enzymes can be interesting as well. Mm. Because, um, you know, when there's disturbances to, to energy production, you, you may see some of the liver enzymes, which is AST, ALT, and GGOT, they can be varied in many ways. Mm. Uh, and there are some nuances to looking at some of the, the, those particular tests. But I think if you're seeing uh, disturbances to liver enzymes as well, that's usually a burden to the liver. Um, that's usually... Um, sometimes related to thyroid, sometimes it's related to kind of uh, pollutant metabolism as well. Um, I think th- th- another interesting one is usually HbA1c and triglycerides as well. Mm-hmm. So a lot of clinicians will look at that and say a- ability to utilize glucose. Um, now, I think the, the problem with just assuming that the glucose is the issue, the HbA1c is, is supposedly the pre-diabetic test. Um, and usually you'll look at something as well called HOMA RR, which is basically the homeostatic control mechanism of insulin release. So those tests are done to look at someone's kind of capacity to utilize glucose uh, and, and blood glucose as a fuel. Now, th- the test itself is not it's not a, a determinism of diabetes. Uh, and a lot of people will misuse it to say that, oh, it's because you can't, um, you know, you can't you're, you're consuming too much sugar. Um, it's usually a sign that you can't metabolize glucose efficiently, but the actual test itself is fraught with inherent difficulties. So it's not, not always a good test. And we know that with glucose, for example, having this, this, uh, this range, again, when it's usually flagged, if someone's over a hundred, it's usually said, Oh, high glucose or, you know, getting over 110 high glucose. So, well, now you need to cut back on sugar as an example, just because you're consuming too much sugar. Mm. Yes, people can consume too much sugar, but also it's usually c- combined with eating a lot of irritants, crappy preservatives, uh, high fat foods as well that can cause that. And obviously high in polyunsaturated fatty acids, which can also compromise the ability for glucose to be used as well. So um, sometimes you'll also see high triglycerides with that as well. And the triglycerides can be the, the effect of not being able to use glucose. So you'll see a higher glucose value and the higher triglycerides will be kind of being dumped into the system to break down fats and reuse them as a fuel. So I, I think it's just useful to look at perhaps glucose and, and triglycerides as an example of you not being able to utilize carbohydrates efficiently. Does that mean you need to cut them out? No. Could you cut eat a little less? That might help possibly in some cases, but actually restoring the ability to use them is probably going to be the key thing. But that might come from, so for example, the more carbs we eat, the more thiamine we generally need. Uh, now, as a rule with your kind of RDAs, a lot of people say that if you if you have like um, an extra thousand calories in your diet coming in, especially mainly from carbs, and this is where kind of perhaps athletes were, who were, might increase as well, is that you need an extra milligram of thiamine. I think that kind of... Uh, value is kind of grossly misinterpreted because often these, some people do much better on 50, 100 and some studies show 600 to 1000 um, milligrams of uh, thiamine a day. So thiamine and your you know B2, B1, B2 and B3 can be really good uh, ways of being able to use carbohydrates more efficiently, uh, as can being able to utilize enough thyroid hormone. So you'll often see um, a lot of issues around metabolic syndrome, which is classified as your high cholesterol, high triglycerides, poor glucose dysregulation. There's so much evidence that suggests that people can be hypothyroid or subclinically low thyroid. And bear in mind, these people are gonna be pretty disturbed from a metabolic perspective. Mm -hmm. So again, looking at those thyroid blood tests might not be a great way of understanding that, but having this kind of metabolic syndrome profile might be a good indicator that somebody needs more thyroid to be looking at. But again, going back and look at TSH might be a poor indicator here. This is where cholesterol values being elevated might be a, a good indicator that the thyroid need is, is, is something that needs to happen. Mm, awesome. Um, well, thanks so much, uh, Keith. And as always, guys, don't forget to take a screenshot and share your biggest takeaways on Instagram stories and tag me at K-I-T-T-Y-B-L-O-M-F-I-L-D. And each week I pick a winner. Uh, sorry, each week, each month I pick a winner and they get a tub of Saturate Premium Collagen valued at $79. Now I will pop all of the links to Tomo 
in the uh, notes uh, below. And yeah, thanks so much, Tomo. I'm sure we'll have you back on soon. It's been fucking great. <laughs>